Church of Christ Church in Barbados. My name is Lester Merle, and I'm glad to have you on board with us tonight as we continue on the subject of cultivating um, a, an atmosphere in this church of prayer and revival. We've touched on prayer for quite a while. Tonight we want to talk a little bit about revival. And when I talk about revival, I want to use the word refreshing as a synonym. Revival and refreshing. And I want you to personalize this message tonight. I want you to be revived. I want you to be refreshed. I want you to be restored. I want you personally to cultivate an atmosphere of prayer and fasting. And when we do, what happens tonight is only the beginning of what will happen among us. If you give me an amen if you believe that. What has happened tonight, God is going to come down. I tell you that is when we are in the presence of God. Somebody be interpreting tongues over there. Somebody be having a gift over here. And somebody be something else happening in the church. We'll have a manifestation of God's power and God's presence. And we're also looking for revelation. Where God will just pull back the curtain a little bit. That's what the word revelation means. Um, the Lord pulls back the curtain a little bit. And let us see some things that we have never seen before. If you're going that way with me, wave your hand at me. Hallelujah. So we want to talk a little bit, for just a little bit tonight, about revival. When you think about revival, you ladies who have your green thumb, think of that plant that is wilting. And you get a stick and you prop it up or you feed it with some plant food or some water or whatever. And you put it in the shade and, and sooner or later that, that, that plant is revived. The plant that was bowing is now revived. That's what I'm talking about. Or maybe... Somebody who fainted or collapsed someplace or came down with a seizure or whatever the case may be. And after a little bit of praying and maybe spraying some cork in their face or something like that, they are revived. Amen? But then there are cases when people have heart attacks. And then the, the medical person will have to come with those two paddles and put them on your chest and give an electric shock. And before long, you are revived. That's what I'm talking about. If the Lord is talking to us about revival, in our text, Psalm 85, uh, you're going to see that you're going to see the word again is coming up in this text, which means that you were once revived, something happened along the line, and we are crying out to God for a revival again. Psalm 85. I want verse 5, but I'm going to go from verse 1 to make you familiar with the word of God. Psalm 85, verse 1. Lord. Thou hast been favorable unto thy land. That is true. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. You know when, where, where God has brought you from. You know what you're going through. Whether it was sickness, disease, whether it were financial difficulties or abuse or whatever the case may be. But God brought you back from that kind of captivity. The devil had you captive and you almost gave up. But God held you close. So that you wouldn't give up. Give me an amen, somebody. You remember this morning's message. Listen to verse 2, though. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Can everybody say amen to that? Amen. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people all day long. I've got to ask God to forgive me for some iniquity. It's either in thought, word, or deed. And I believe you are the same. I'm not that bad. I believe you are the same. But you want to find yourself in a situation that whether the Lord comes or he calls, any moment he calls for you, that you could say, here am I, because all is well with my soul. Amen? So you cannot wait until night in your bed and come up with a heavenly father, here am I, cry in my little bed I lie. But all during the day, if you are walking with the Lord and if you are pursuing a life of holiness, um, everything that causes you to violate the principles of God, you're just going to be crying to God, God have mercy upon me. Lord, forgive me of my sin. How many of you find yourself in that situation? But that is how it ought to be. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. God is in the business of covering sin. Please don't try to expose people's sin. God is in the business of covering sin. I didn't just say condoning. I said covering sin. In Psalm 32, I think it is, we don't have to go there, but it says, Lord, if thou didst mark iniquity, and that's an accounting term, it speaks of having a ledger and writing things in the ledger, you know, keeping all your, your expenses in the ledger. 
God doesn't have a ledger where he keeps your sin. Lord, if thou didst mark iniquity, who will be able to stand? But I'm thankful that God does not have a ledger of every sin that I commit. But the Bible tells me as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. And he has cast my sins in the depth of the sea. Amen. And like I said to you last time, it is an affront for you to go digging up my sins that God has cast in the sea. It's none of your business. If God wanted to know, he would have kept them. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Listen to this. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. When I read verses like that, my mind goes back to Calvary. And I keep telling myself, I've really got to put together for us a series on Calvary. Because when we understand what happened to Jesus at Calvary, and when we understand what happened to us, our life is going to be drastically changed. All the wrath of the Old Testament that he's talking about, all that wrath culminated or terminated in Jesus. It doesn't come down to us anymore because Jesus absorbed all of that. And that is why we love him. That's why we serve him. That's why we sing him. Can I get a loud amen tonight? That amen was too poor. Can I get a loud amen? Amen. That's what Calvary is all about. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath, and thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. My, I am so glad. If the Lord had poured out his anger upon me, like he poured out his anger upon those in the Old Testament who were under the law, but I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't be here today. But God has turned away from us the fierceness of his anger. Lift your hands before the Lord and say, thank you, Jesus. Come on, thank you. Seriously, no, not because, come on, tell him something else. Thank you, Lord, that you turned away the fierceness of your anger. You've turned away the fierceness of your wrath. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, he that hath the son hath life. That's if you're saved. But he that hath not the son, the wrath of God abideth on him. You're storing up wrath if you don't know the if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If Jesus did not cover your wrath on Calvary because you have not accepted him, the time is coming when there's going to be such an outpouring of the wrath of God. You read the book of Revelation and you read about the bowls, you read about the vials, and you read about the trumpets, and things are so bad that the Bible says even the rich men uh they, they curse God rather than repent of their sins, and there were those who are asking God to let to let um let the stones fall on them and kill them and hide them from the wrath of God. It's going to be an awful time for those who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. But for us, we are happy tonight that the Lord has turned himself from, from the fierceness of his anger. Oh, my. I think of Corey, Dathan, and Abiram. They had the wrath of God. God opened up a hole and swallowed them up. I think about Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, who went secretly... And got some money from Naaman. And he was made leprous. I think of Miriam. Who spoke against her brother. And God made her leprous. I think of one man. Who violated the Sabbath. By going out to pick up some sticks to cook. And he was stoned to death. That's the wrath of God. Those are the things that we have escaped. So when we say that God has turned himself. From the fiercest of his anger. We can say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. But now he, 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 he makes a little sense right here, and he's going to something. He's making the plea now to God. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger towards us to cease. Everywhere the children of Israel looked around, there was something that God was angry with them for. On their way to, from Egypt to the promised land, they did so many things that were out of the way. Huh? They, 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 they told God they didn't want a king. I mean, they don't want him to be their king. They criticized the food that they had. All sorts of things they did. And God had to be angry. But here he's asking God to turn away. And verse 5 is my text, though. Will thou be angry with us forever? Will thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Verse 6. Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Lord, will you not revive us again, 
That is what we are praying to God for here at the Peg Welcome into the church. Yeah, we are in a state of revival. Believe me, we are not trying to lift ourselves above where we ought to, but we are in a state of revival. Maybe you talk to somebody in this church who can't see anything good happening. You have a bad friend. They can't see anything good happening. That you're in the wrong place. You have somebody, something's wrong with everybody except them. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's not so. You see what God did for us tonight? They're probably upset that God will bless you the way that He did. Because there's some people who could only see a glass half empty. They can't see a glass half full. There are those persons who can't see what God is doing. Because God said, there are those who have eyes, but they see not. Meaning that they have physical eyes, but they do not see with their spiritual eyes. It says they have ears, but they hear not. They, they hear with their physical ears. But when it comes to the spiritual ear, they're not hearing. So one man said, for 30 years, he preached one doctrine and said, God told him to preach this doctrine for 30 years. Last week, he turned up and said, I was wrong. And for 30 years, he was saying, God told him, be careful. These people who come to you saying that God said, don't let me get off on that. Though. Be careful with people who come to you and say that God said. The Bible tells us here, the book of Peter, we're going to put the scripture up, up on the screen. That we have a more sure word of prophecy. Listen to what the Bible says. Every problem you have with your husband, your wife, your children, your health or whatever. The answer is here. You don't have to go to anybody to, for them to tell you anything. Look at this. The, Lord, the Bible said that the Lord has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Look at this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. If somebody gives you a prophecy, we have a more sure word. More sure than what they tell you. Okay? And the Lord said, you better take heed to this. When somebody could preach for 30 years, and every time they preach on, they say, God told me this. Is God a liar? That all of a sudden now, in the month of July, well, all that I said was wrong. You could throw away all of my books that I ever wrote on this subject. All my CDs that I ever that I ever had on this subject. You could throw them in the garbage because I was preaching the wrong thing. Well, we, we all must preach the wrong thing sometimes. But my problem is when for 30 years you said that God told you that. And now all of a sudden you're saying you were wrong. So God was feeding you with lies. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Well, let's get back on track. That was just on my heart. That's not part of the sermon tonight. I just want you to listen to God. Even in this church, there are people who walk around here telling you things from God. You better be careful. I'm not going to tell you don't listen because prophecy is one of the fivefold ministry. One, sorry, one of the gifts. And we need prophets and we need prophecy in the church. But you better be careful. You better be careful. I don't listen too much to the prophets. As a matter of fact, I'm scared of them. Scared. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. But let's get back to Psalm 85 and verse 6 as we talk for just a short time tonight about revival. Because we want this church to be in a state of revival. In the book of Revelation, there was a church, I don't know which one it is, but it had a reputation that it was alive. But Jesus said, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. We don't want to be like that. We don't want to be dead. We want to be alive, alive, alive forevermore. We want to be alive. But there's some things that you will notice in this verse that when you are revived, you're going to be able to rejoice. You see that verse there? Will thou not revive us again? Why? Why? What, revival just to dance? Revival just to do what? What's the purpose of this revival? That we may be able to rejoice in him. You're not... Could you give me that in two or three more translations? Will thou not revive us that your people may rejoice in thee? Why are they going to rejoice? We're going to look at that a minute after we read a few. Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Another translation. I want to get this because when you revive, you're not going to come to church with a long face. When you come to church, when you revive, the praise and worship leaders will not have to work so hard to pump you to praise God and to worship. Can we get any other translation, please? Maybe the New Living, you don't have any more right now. Okay, 
But you get the message. Will you not revive us? When you're revived, you're going, to, you're going to be able to rejoice. You're going to rejoice because of the presence of God. Tonight, we could have sung for another hour. Because we sense the presence of God. I don't mean the presence like God is present everywhere. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the manifest presence. I'm talking about the wind that you see in the tree. The wind is everywhere. But you don't see it. But it's manifest when you see the, the tree swing. That's what we want to talk about. The manifest presence of God. And look tonight, people who are not even accustomed to rejoicing were rejoicing. People who are not even accustomed to clapping their hands tonight. Because I believe that God is honoring his word. And that's what God is doing among us. Keep away from those who have nothing good to say about the church. Keep away from those who could always or could, or see everything wrong. And, and things like that. The music is too loud. This is too that. The service is too long. This, keep yourself from some people. The Lord said from such turn away. God is moving. Now in 1 Kings chapter 8. Let's look at the presence of God, verses 1 to 11. I, want, I really want to read this. I want to show you a revival here. And for the next couple of weeks, I want to show you 14 revivals in the word of God and show you what caused these revivals. The first one I, I gave you last week was under John the Baptist. And then uh, when I'm finished this section now, I'm going to talk to you about the revival that came to Israel under Asa. Then I'm going to talk to you about a revival that came under Moses and Samuel and Elijah and Jonah and Hezekiah and Josiah and, and Philip uh, uh, and Paul and Ephesus. All those persons were involved in revivals. And we could even take our eyes out of the Bible and see revivals that happened in Wales, revivals that happened in America. And you will hear about the great awakening. And you will hear about those great revivals around, around um, the last hundred years. There were some massive revivals. And you could hear about the revival that happened at Azusa Street. When people began to speak in tongues for the first time in many, many years. So there were revivals across the land over the years. But we want to start at the Pegwell Community Church with a localized revival. And believe God that our revival was spread to St. Michael. And from St. Michael to St. James. And from St. James to St. Joseph. And from St. Joseph to St. Lucy. And from St. Lucy beyond. Grenada. St. Vincent. And so they'll be asking us to get a ferry. And we'll put 75 members of the Pegwell Community Church. And we'll get this little ferry. And we'll be heading off to St. Vincent to share our revival that God has given us. How many of you would like to see that? How many of you believe that that can happen? This is what we want. Amen. This is what we want. So listen to the word of God. And the simplicity of the gospel.